Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> everybody knows that because we want to be able to hear every word of Billy's presentation. Um, well, I guess we should actually get started. Um, thank everybody for your, your travel planning tips. I think um, those were very helpful. It's good to know um, what's been successful for everyone. So um, I'm going to start the official. Welcome to the Evergreen Club Homestays Virtual Travel Experience and visit our website at evergreenclub.com for the best travel options available. Um, so tonight we have um, Lanny and Billy had taken a trip, a long trip, like a six month trip, I believe. And the pictures that Billy's gonna share tonight are is part one of their time spent in Italy. And it, it sounds like um, they, these pictures are from Rome going north through Italy. And so um, I've seen the, he sent me the whole file. I had such a hard time picking out the best picture to put on the, the Zoom invitation because they're all just outstanding. Uh, so I need to make Billy a co-host. I should have done that earlier. Where is Billy? There you are. All right. And so everyone needs to mute themselves now. Um, you know how to, so Janice, you're not muted yet. And Genevieve, you, there you go. Thank you, everyone. And you know the, the drill that will, um, you can chat, type in questions. And um, I, if it's, if I can, I'll interrupt Billy. If not, we'll wait till the end. And then um, we'll go through the questions in the chat. And then we'll, um, and if you have other additional questions, we'll, we can cover those too. So um, you may go and share your screen, Billy. Thank you so much. All right. Well, uh, Lanny and I did have, have the opportunity to do some traveling. And uh, when we started in uh, March of this year, we did uh, Albania and Montenegro and Bosnia and, and Croatia and Slovenia and Slovakia. And then we uh, had another set of travels and so we did get finally make it to Rome and we had been to the northern lakes so this is going to cover several different stops along the way we'll spend some time in Rome and then we'll go uh, through the Tuscany area up to Florence and we're still in the Tuscany area when we go over to Pisa and that's probably as far as we'll make it tonight is on our way up to the northern uh, lakes but uh, Italy was uh, very enjoyable and we uh, enjoyed the many days that we got to spend there. Uh, the reference that I saw was that it's uh, referred to as the uh, eternal city. And it's, it's hard to grasp the magnitude of this town. It, the King Romulus, uh, was first king. He was put into power on April 21st, 753 BC. Rome is the capital of two countries, of Italy as well as Vatican City. And I thought what was unique is Rome reached 1 million inhabitants in 133 BC. So just about the time that, that uh, 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 you biblically think of that time period, that is already a very, very large city. And in comparison, uh, London didn't reach a million until 1810 and Paris 1850 and New York 1875. So Rome been a large city for, for nearly 2000 years ahead of these others. Rome has 2000 fountains, 
three of them's very, 300 of them's very large. They have, it has 900 churches, 83 museums. And the one thing that makes it unique among the European capitals is it's the largest area of green space. And it is uh, uh, not going to be covering all of these. We're just going to cover uh, a little of this. Uh, this picture shows a red area at the very bottom and uh, the, the baths of uh, Caracelia. This is one you'd think I'd start with somewhere else, but the one thing I found out about Rome is, is that they do love baths and that they must have been a very clean society because they had plenty of baths uh, in the places that we traveled to in the extent of the Roman Empire. When, when we were in England, uh, that was the, we went to Adrian's Wall on the northern uh, portion of the Roman Empire, and there was even bath structures up there. And so I just brought it up because everybody thought I'd start off with the Colosseum. <laughs> but this one is one where the tile work that's on the on the floors is still there and in good shape for the age that it is. And uh, it's one that uh, catches your eye. All right. So from there, we're going to move up to, to this area. And the reason I circle that is because there's much more to the Colosseum in that area. The Palatine Hill uh, is one of the seven hills of the, the Roman, uh, of Rome as it established. And in this area is the Roman Forum as, as well as the Palatine Hills. And you can spend one day, two days, three days there easy just going through the Roman, uh, the Roman ruins. But everybody knows the Colosseum. Everybody may not have been to it yet. Uh, it was built and completed in uh, AD 80, and it will set 50,000 spectators. And if you bring it to standing room, it's, it handles about 80,000. And the day we were there uh, is in the fall, uh, just on a recent trip, and it was hot. Uh, for those of you that have mobility issues, they do have an elevator that brings you up to this uh, level. And so you can look down on the floor and see the tunnels through here that the gladiators and the animals came in to tra through trap doors onto the Coliseum floor. And then you have to go down the same elevator to get back to ground level. But at least for those that have mobility issues, there is opportunity to get around that. And from the other end, you get the idea that that floor wasn't covered nearly as much as it looked like from the other end. And uh, this is a very large, well-built structure. It's actually, when it, in its uh, time period, it could be sealed off and they could float ships and have sea battles for the entertainment of the people that's there. So. It, it's uh, a very uh, impressive structure. And uh, the scaffolding is there because they're, they're working at, uh, at stabilizing the outer wall. Uh, uh, I think this is a constant work in progress. And uh, it, it's one that uh, uh, even on the outside, you can see this, the areas of scaffolding. And uh, the Palatine Hill uh, is, like I said, the seven hills that's there. You'll find that in, included in your Colosseum ticket is the opportunity to go to the Palatine Hill as well as go to the Roman Forum. And so you can take advantage of it. Uh, if, you, if you're in the Colosseum and, and you see the Arch of Constantine, you're going the wrong direction. Uh, you can look over here and you can see these runs, but there's no way to get into them from there. You're actually going to want to walk down uh, the other direction and enter. And you can either enter and go 
to the right and go around this way uh, and behind and come in an entrance or you can go this way and go over to the Arch of Titus and uh, you, you can uh, see uh, Temple of Venus uh, here. And the thing that uh, I will suggest to you is get some maps because uh, there's a lot to take in here. If you have a tourist by locals or a, a, a person that, that's very knowledgeable on this, they can uh, take you through there and point out structures. The Temple of Venice is right here. But uh, if you're trying to walk around over to the Basilica uh, of uh, Max, Maxin, Maxentius, uh, you can come in uh, to this area. So a couple of areas that you can come into. This is the Arch of Constantine, uh, Arch of Titus. Uh, there's also uh, the oldest arch uh, that's there, and it's uh, Septimatus uh, Severus. And if I'm slaughtering these, I apologize. But the next map I'll show you, uh, this is uh, Roman ruins for dummies, and so this is this is a, another uh, map, and there are several out on the internet that you can go and grab and and get an idea of, of what you're looking at. Uh, this one I'll reference here uh, later. This is uh, Circus Maximus, where the, the the chariot races took place, and uh, it, I'll point it out uh, here shortly. You have to realize here's the Colosseum and you are entering the center of what used to be the Roman Empire. Uh, you're walking history. You're seeing uh, where history was made. Uh, the Arch of Titus here is, is just one of the identifying places as you go through there. And uh, it, it's... Uh, like I said, a place you can spend a lot of time. If it's a rainy day, I'd say don't go. If it's a hot day, take plenty of water. It's, uh, I know that I was going through about a half a gallon of water a day, and I probably should have been drinking a gallon of water a day. Uh, but you, as I indicated earlier, you can go through this Basilica Maximatus in, or and Constantine and come in the other way. But you can walk all the way through uh, this facility and see these uh, ruins. This is Arch of Titus way down here and the Arch is Septimasa Service uh, here. And uh, again, you can go to the right and go around to another set uh, of the palace or go back the, the other direction, but M Impressive. You can spend a lot of time uh, looking at these. This is uh, the the <laughs> Vespasian. Vespasian. Uh, this is actually a church that's still active there in Rome and in the Temple of the Sun. Uh, just one of many things to look at here, and. Uh, we can spend a lot of time. Uh, I reference this. This is Circus Maximus down here. We're looking at the uh, Palace of uh, Domitian, or Domitian, and this is is been where many many emperors lived. Uh, it was built in 92 A.D. by Emperor Domitian. And for over 300 years, it's where the Roman uh, emperors lived. It was built, uh, built of three distinct structures, the, the Domus Flavia and the Domus Augustina, and also the Domitian or the, the stadium. Uh, each had its own purpose. Uh, Domus Flavius was used for business the judicial functions. The, it was uh, very extravagant, uh, uh, many uh, decorative coliseums, fe fresco, fresco, and 
fountains, very beautiful. Uh, Domus Augustina was a personal residence and uh, it, it had its own wings, it's had its own uh, entertainment facility, its own pool, its own garden. And then the last one is basically is used as a garden. So this is what it looked like when it was built. You can see that each of these structures quite large. And so now when we look at this from Circus Maximus down here, it gives you a little bit more feel for it. Uh, again, this, this is uh, Flavius and uh, Augusta, and then uh, down from there is the garden. All the statues that used to sit on these pedestals are in the museum and the museum is extra cost to go there. Again, this is Domus Flavius right here. And then this is uh, Domus Augustus and then the palace and all from Circus Maximus. I wanted to show Circus Maximus because this is where the chariot races took place. None of this exists. But in its time period, this was the largest sporting event center in Rome, and it could handle more than the Colosseum. And when you get down on the lower level, you can see that you can run four chariots side by side in a race when you're going uh, around this competition. So it's much larger than it looks like. And from here, if you just go over to, to the river, I'm just bringing it up while I'm thinking of it. There's the mouth of truth. A lot of people ask about it because they've seen it in movies. It's a first century drain cover. Uh, it's supposed to have a legend. If you put your hand in here and tell a lie, you're going to lose your hand. And so it's, it's one of these that, uh, uh, it may be on your bucket list to see. And so when you're there, you're close to, to the building that you can see this in. After you've spent your days or week seeing what you're seeing, we'll go over and we'll see the front of this structure. But I do want to give you a few more tips here is you have two entrances, as I indicated over at the, going in at the Arch of Titus or going behind the, the other and coming in and a couple of exits also. Uh, your admission is included in your Colosseum ticket uh, for Palestine as well as the Roman Forum. Uh, if you wanna go to these other uh, museums and, and housing structures, it's a special ticket that you have to purchase ahead of time. Uh, the operation hours is 9 a.m. So when they open, Closing varies. It's in the low seasons, 4.30 p.m., high season, 7.15 p.m., and the last entry is one hour before closing. Only two days are closed, January 1st and December 25th. So from there, we're going to go up to the one I pointed out. It's called the Altar of the Fatherland for the English speaking. I, I'm not going to try the Italian side of things, but Anyway, it's got uh, two chariots drawn by four horses with wings uh, structures here. It also has this very large uh, uh, statue of a man riding a horse. And this structure here is like many, many countries. It's the tomb of the unknown soldiers and they have posted guards on here. And it, from this angle, you can get an idea of how big this structure is, because you already know this one's huge, so that one's very large. And it's another one of many places to go visit. Now we're gonna go to the Pantheon. Uh, it's one that many have on their to-do list. It's in the Piazza della Rotunda. Uh, it was built in the second century uh, redone in its current uh, state uh, with the fountain out in front and, and uh, the obelisk on top of the fountain in 1550 when they rebuilt the aqueduct. But uh, this has been a, a church ever since uh, uh, 
I believe the sixth century, I have it noted here in a second. But when you go in there, the dome of this structure uh, it is still, looks like it's in just as good a shape as the day they started. This was uh, completed back in 128 AD, been a church since seventh century. And look at that dome, looks almost brand new has many, many religious uh, artifacts uh, throughout that you can go and look at. And uh, it, it's, I know a lot of people love museums and this is a great one to go into and to see. All right, so from here, we're gonna go to, to the uh, Piazza Navona, it's one of the, one of the more famous ones, and uh, we'll work work uh, from there to another location. But this one, this is where you want to probably go eat a meal because if you go to the piazza, if you look down both sides, it has places, many bars, many restaurants, plenty of places to go. Inside the piazza is two very nice fountains. You'll see the fountain of Neptune as well as the fountain of Four Rivers. And uh, doesn't matter which angle you get on to the, the fountain of Neptune, it's just absolutely uh, uh, impressive. And if you go down to the fountain of Four Rivers, uh, on top of that fountain is this ablice. And I'm going back. Uh, these are the muscle tone. Everything about this is done well. And if you get close to the water, uh, the lines, the horses, uh, it's, a, it's a very nice fountain. And as I indicated down both sides, there's, there's lots of bars and restaurants so uh, you can take on a meal. We left uh, Piazza Nova. Navona close to dark and so we crossed the bridge and got a great picture of St. Uh, Peter's and I'll show it here in a little bit. Uh, we're going to go to the Temple of Hadrian on our way over to Trevi Fountain. Uh, the only reason you'd walk by this is it's the, one of the oldest structures in Rome. It still has 11 of its original 15 columns standing. Uh, you know, you're looking at, at 2,000 years of history uh, here, and it's on the way uh, to the Trevi Fountain. And uh, the Trevi Fountain is in a very small piazza, and it's probably considered small because this fountain is huge. If you look at the lower right corner here at the size of the people, it'll give you an idea how big this is. It is massive. So many people visit this that every year they collect out of the waters about 1.3 million euros that's been tossed in by the visitors that year. I considered it the most impressive of the 2000 fountains. Of course, I didn't go see them all. I did see this one and uh, it's beautiful. No matter which angle you take, I thought it was absolutely beautiful and uh, well worth the time to stop and take a look at. This one may not show up on your screen. It's in the very top right corner. It says Spanish Steps. This is, this is another one from the Terevi Fountain. It's not very far to go over to that little piazza and uh, see. A lot of people like to take that as a backdrop uh, on the way up to the French church. It's a, it's a tri-level uh, look to it. And so it makes a great picture. Uh, the fountain itself just looks like an old boat and maybe that's your thing, but to look at these three levels working up to, to the temple there, uh, just about everybody that knows that that's on their to-do list to take a picture uh, that they certainly get that done. Uh, I wanted to show this Basilica Santa Maria uh, Mar Marguerite. 
because it's so deceptive. And the reason it's deceptive, if you come in on this side uh, and you got the basilic here and, and uh, obelisk, sorry, the obelisk here, you see that this has domes. But if you go to the other end and come in, you don't see any domes at all. So when you go walking through the, the this uh, basilica, you have very distinct differences in look. It's beautiful, like many of the churches that you go to, it's beautiful. And you this, this is, I've seen so many churches in this year that I can't even keep up with all of the ones I've seen, but this is just as nice as any. And then if you go to the other section where the domes are, it's beautiful, beautiful ceilings. And I like, I like the uh, stained glass, all seeing eye and, and uh, you see the beauty of the, the structures here and, it's uh, just one of many, many basilicas and churches in the town that's worth your time to go see. All right, now this one, uh, I wanna explain a little bit before I show the picture. Uh, this one was a mausoleum, it's built as a mausoleum by, by Hadrian and uh, it, was used by other Roman emperors as a mausoleum. But there is a tunnel that goes from here over to Vatican City. And that is used as an escape route for the popes when they're being invaded. This mausoleum was later turned into a fortress um, and used to protect Rome from various attacks. And that secret tunnel is very useful uh, to the uh, popes, and in front of this is the Bridge of Angels, and uh, there's bridges all up and down the river here, and it, it's a one that's certainly notable, and you can, second, you know what you're looking for, you can see it from a number of places as you cross the, cross the river, and uh, the, this is just the, the, one of the entrances to it and I was on a bus going by and took this picture and if you look right across to the other side you see the bridge angels and if you take a picture the other way there's three or four bridges that away and uh, this is another one of those structures that you may want to make a note to go see. Now as I indicated as we left the plaza that night we uh, uh, went across a bridge, took a picture of St. Peter's uh, Basilica, and this is where we're gonna start the next day. Now, Vatican City is right here. It's the smallest country in, you know, anywhere. And uh, the Pope's uh, residence is here. And uh, the Vatican Museum's here, the, the Sistine Chapel's here. All right, somebody asked how we're doing this. Well, we're, we're on a tour and uh, we're on a bus with about 35 other people. And so they're dropping us off at the door at most of these places and what we're walking uh, is minimal as we can, but we're still breaking 15,000 to 20,000 steps a day. So we're still getting in plenty of walking. Uh, the Vatican City, we got up at 7.30 that morning and we was like, why are we getting up so early? She said, it's not early. Uh, we was on the bus at eight, by 8.30 we were here and there was already 400 people ahead of us and we finally got in at 9.15 to get into St. Peter's Basilica. And by the time we got uh, uh, through security, the line probably had 2,000 people in it. Uh, 
I'll, I'll have to ask my wife on the tour company. We, we used, uh, I believe it was, uh, uh, I'll, I'll ask her and answer that question here later. The uh, lines are long and as I indicated, it was nine o'clock and we were already sweating bullets, not a breeze, hot summer temperatures, Going in September is not a great idea. This this is more like going early spring, late fall, avoid the heat and try to avoid the crowds by, by the same uh, measure. Uh, Obelisk uh, here and is a you know, fountain here, all on the uh, square. And this structure and this structure, this a clock, but this one, You'll find this everywhere. And what that is, is the keys of the kingdom given to Peter. And you'll see this all over Europe. And it's uh, one that uh, I'll even show you two or three other times that we run across this. And uh, it's just one of those things that you need to know what you're looking at or you'll ask and you'll find out it's keys to the kingdom. But we're trying to get into uh, St. Peter Basilica, largest basilica in the world. And it is beautiful ceilings, beautiful columns, beautiful fiescos, beautiful paintings, sculptures. It, it's the best of the best. There's the two keys to the king. It's uh, domes and it, it's just I'll let the pictures do the talking. And as you're walking through here on the floor, it'll say Basilica such and such is this big. You walk on down, then in Basilica, this is this side. To let you know, in comparison, if you've been in these other large, large Basilica, that this one is massive big. And uh, I enjoyed going through it, enjoyed just craning my neck and looking up and getting a sore neck and looking around. And uh, I was glad to be there and glad to get to see it. And it. It's probably got my favorite stained glass I've ever seen with the dove coming in and, and I liked it. And the artwork, the wood, the, the stone, I just can't emphasize how beautiful all this was to take in and the sculpture is just great artists great masters that put these together uh, and then we left there we we're going somewhere else and then we'll come back a couple of hours later and go through the museum but on the way out you get to see the colorful swiss guards and ever since the sixth century the pope said there's no fiercer fighting man than a Swiss guard. And uh, so they've always had Swiss guards at the Vatican since sixth century and they are colorful. You can't miss them if you try and uh, enjoyed seeing them. After a couple of hours, we came back to go through the museum. This structure is big and that is understatement. I think they said if you read everything that was in here and did it justice, you could spend a year going through this facility. Uh, up here at the top is Michelangelo, again, the Keys of the Kingdom and another famous uh, artist of his time. And uh, this was the old entry. We go in the new entry. First thing you see when you walk in is the hall of sculptures and if that doesn't impress you, I don't know what will, but you come up the stairs and then you're just looking down a quarter mile of hallway. And impressive is, my wife says I overuse that word, but that's the word for this place. This little purple or pinkish flag is carried by our tour guide. Uh, somebody asked what company we use for this. And uh, anyway, this this is we're walking through here, and there's thousands of people. I think they they stop at about twenty five thousand people a day, 
going through here and it's just ceilings to look at and columns to look at and, and everything in the world to look at religious related stuff uh, tapestries maps uh, it's just amazing place to go through this tapestry i have no idea what kind of master put that together but that's a great piece of work and and well done and i i really like that that uh, tapestry there uh many many uh halls you like i said we had two three hours <laughs> we didn't do it justice at all you you could spend a year here then we finally made it out into the courtyard before we went into the sistine chapel uh, courtyard's a great place to rest. Uh, plenty of things to look at in the courtyard. And uh, when you get to the Sistine Chapel, they say don't take pictures. So I did not. But there's plenty on the web that others took. So I'll share what they took with you. Because this is the story of creation in, in our association. And uh, it, life after death all in, in, done in art and uh, you just spend about 20 minutes just looking at the walls and the ceilings you can sit on benches along the side of the wall and just uh, think of how long it took for them to paint this and appreciate it and then as you leave, don't forget to take a picture of the exit because that spiral staircase makes a great picture. Okay, that's Rome. And I tried to do it justice and I probably, yeah, that's, that's quite the deal. We're going to be headed up here to Florence. And as we head to Florence, uh, we're going through Tuscany and uh, I love Tuscany. It's certainly on my go back to list. The rolling hills, the vineyards, the, the wineries, the beauty of it is what draws you. And it's just not one place. It's just mile after mile after mile. It's just vineyards and wineries. And it's, it's, great we're on a bus and we're going 70 miles an hour and it's just plenty to take pictures of my wife actually went out for a, a, a meal and got some beautiful pictures at, at sunset of the winery that she was at and as you go uh, through you'll see these cities on the hill and th this is one of probably 20 that we saw on the way to Florence. And you can go to these little towns and enjoy the narrow roads, enjoy the shops and, and what you get to see. Uh, the, it's just very tasteful. And uh, all, all of them are not created equal, but all of them are beautiful. Uh, and most of them have a church. Seems like plenty of churches to go to in Italy. Some of them are are just very noteworthy, and and others are are uh, just okay. It's just what you happen to run into and get to see. But cities on the hill is one of those that you could probably spend two or three weeks just going through those and enjoying the what you find in the small towns and the shops and the places to eat and enjoy. And then you finally get to Florence. Now, how am I doing on time or should we uh, start looking at a breaking's place here? Um, well, we were gonna do part one and two. What are we, um, we're still on part one, right? Right. Yeah. Um, I think we keep going. All right. I will do, I will do Florence. Okay. Yes, and, please. And when you do Florence, it is first thing you want to do is stop at the Piazza Michelangelo and take a picture. And 
that overlook lets you see uh, some outstanding beauty. There's a river right here in the front and uh, it has several bridges down it. Only one of them dates back of any age because when the Germans left in World War II, they blew up every bridge except one. And uh, so most of the bridges are new. I'll show you the one that still remains from, I believe it's dated 1300 something. This is, the, is a basilica like none I've seen. It has a dome that has a history uh, worth reading about. And I'll show you a book where you can uh, read about that dome and beautiful point to, to take it. The city was established by Julius, C Julius Caesar in 59 BC. It has 100 fountains in the town, 100 churches, approximately 70 museums. If you like gardens, there's one outside on the edge of town that opened in 1766 that has about 111 acres, very beautiful garden. And uh, the cathedral, the Diomo, uh, I love this, this work and whether you're looking at the baptistry across the street or you're looking at the tower or you're looking at the dome, uh, it's, a, it's a, just a beautiful, distinct building that I have not seen anything else that looks like it and well worth uh, taking your time to stop at. This one catches uh, the church with the dome the tower and the baptistry in the front, all, all in that picture. But if you want to read about the dome, Ross King wrote about it in uh, Brunicelli's Dome. Uh, it's a thin book and it's out there on the web if you can tolerate doing it the way the web does it. The whole thing's there online from the National Archives, but uh, you can order it on off online and uh, read it yourself or download it from the library. Uh, we went to the, the Piazza della Signora and don't pass this particular setup because that, that four-story museum is deceptive. The statue of David is inside this building, even though it has one on display out here, it's not the original. Here at the bottom left hand is another uh, fountain of Neptune. Over in this building with the three arches is a number of beautiful sculptures that different people work on. And this whole piazza is one that you can spend some serious time in. Uh, the crowds get thick. And what we're trying to do is that we're, we're enjoying the Neptune's fountain here. It's just been reclaimed and it's it's excellent looking. And uh, get that light on it just right and enjoy it. What we're trying to do is over here between uh, the statue of David and this other statue is the entry to go into the museum. And you're going to walk by some beautiful structures that's on display here and just appreciate. Uh, what the sculptor was able to capture uh, there. And when you get into the museum, it is uh, breathtaking also. You just enjoy your time there. Uh, yes, that, the, it met, the Metasius lived in that building, yes. And uh, the, it's one that, you can enjoy the Statue of David uh, while you're there. And then if you look at these others, you say, well, he got started and then stopped. I don't think so. I think that's how far he got and intended to stop. And uh, <coughs> plenty of sculptures on display there as well as art. All right, I promised to, to cover the bridge. We're up on the Michelangelo Plaza, Piazza. And this is the only bridge that didn't get destroyed by the Germans as they were leaving. And this is actually filled with shops and, and you just get to enjoy a, a crowd. 
it to say the least if you go in there but it's it's a beautiful structure and it was built in 1345 and uh, you can uh, spend your day uh, there but I figure you'll be in other churches and piazzas across town I bring this one up nothing really fancy about it I'll show you the church at the end of it um Okay, all right. Somebody said they're supposed to they're supposed to look like they're busting out of the stone. And I looked at it and I said that was more like looked like they didn't finish, but I knew that wasn't true. Uh this piazza is one that has this basilica at the end of it. It has a, a, a statue here and it's got four lines all holding shields. And uh what makes this one uh worth going into and seeing it's 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 a beautiful one uh to go in but it also has uh the the burial site of, of michelangelo as well as another famous artist from the time period and again that's a statue with the four um, lines holding shields and says Florence is the best lasagna and steak is on that plaza. And it, it's a large one and it does have plenty of places to sit down and, and get a drink. I think we even did that ourselves. And, <laughs> but you can walk right by it without knowing that Michelangelo is buried there. And, and I just wanted to bring that up so that, that you would stop. For the people that loves gardens, that 111 acres garden there takes on several different looks depending on where you're at in the garden and uh, this sort of gives you a sight to see the building there so you can say okay I saw this one I had one look I see it over here and it has another look but uh, not the largest garden that we went into while I was in Europe but it's certainly a large one and uh, plenty of structures uh, when we left Florence we were headed over to, to Pisa. And the thing that I was not aware of in that trip as we're going across there, we probably drove by 20 miles of nursery. And when you start putting a dollar figure to this, I mean, we were looking at a hundred million dollar industry, I would guess, maybe 500 million, but I was amazed that how many nurseries in a row you could stack together and that's on both sides of the road as you drive from Florence to, to Pisa. Now when you get to Pisa you can park in the parking lot and take a train trip and don't get it confused because we said be back on the train to get to the bus at such and such time and people didn't realize that this little choo-choo train is not the main train that comes in town. And so they wound up at the main train and they had to go be tracked down before we could leave on the bus. So uh, this one will get you there and get you back. And that doesn't cost much. Uh, there's at least 50 shops in tent type setups on both sides of the street, all the way down the outer wall of the fortress. And you don't even realize it is a fortress until you step through the, the wall of this door, the entry here. And it was, uh, like I said, they're lined up all the way along this wall. But what you're looking for is what everybody looks for. And that's a baptistry the church and the leaning tower of Pisa and being the type of people that we are, you know, we don't want to let it fall. So we're going to get our picture out in front of it and then try to help straighten it up. <laughs> and uh, I think everybody in the world takes that same picture, but uh, we did too. <laughs> and uh, we'll stop there and, and uh, we'll try to start next month. Uh, with the cities by the sea. Okay, well, um, if anyone has any, um, well, let's go through the chat questions and 
Um, you did answer some of them, um, but let's see. Um, oh, so which tour company did you use? Uh, it was a, a branch of Trafalgar. It was, a, it was Cost Saver, which is one of the lower end of Trafalgar's. And they have four or five different levels. And this one is one that does it cheaper, but you're going to be staying in hotels that may or may not pass mustard with you. We didn't know that. And so we didn't know that. So we'll probably pick a higher end one the next time. Tour guide was good. Yeah, we had a great tour guide. Tour guide was phenomenal. Yeah. That one was. I'm going to stop sharing so we can look at each other. Okay. Uh, but, um, so how long in it, or how early did you have to um, make your reservations on the tour? <laughs> uh, we, well, we started in 2019, got rolled to 2020, got rolled to 2022. <laughs> so we started way early, but uh, you yeah. probably don't have to go quite that early. <laughs> We wound up this year doing three years worth of travel in one year and wow. because of everything that got canceled. What was your other tour, the Albania, Slovenia one, was that also a Trafalgar or a different company? That was Gate One. It was Gate One. Gate One. Those are okay. those are the two that we had planned. We should have done it together. Those are the Gate, Gate One was this right. One. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's we our really, next one. Yeah. yeah, we really enjoyed that. We'll do yeah. some other tours with Gate One. Your cost saver tour, did you have Heidi as your tour guide? No. 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 Okay, no. just for people's, uh, for prices, I don't know what his tour was, but we just took our granddaughter on a 10-day Italy, and it, it was only like $1,200 a person. And if you count up the cost of all your hotels, it's more than that twelve hundred dollars. So the, you're getting the bus for free, the meals for free, the entrances for free, the tour guide for free. It's really, really worth it. Well, they did. They take care of a lot of business that you oh, yeah. don't have to take care of. Exactly. And the only thing is, you got to be knowledgeable or alert to the fact that the add-ons every night's an add-on. And I think we wound up with yeah. about seven hundred dollars each with add-ons. Okay, to, yeah. We, we know now which ones not to take and which to take, so um, in terms of their add-ons, you know, we, we won't go off on their $60 dinner, we'll go off and do a $25 dinner, yeah. Absolutely. I did the Tuscan one. Okay. Um, and it was well worth Oh, did you know why the steps were called the Spanish steps? Oh, I, don't know. I actually do not know why. No, actually, it said that in the in the text that was okay because uh, Spain and Italy had just had become friends after a war. That is correct. That's yeah. It, it was. It was. Uh, that's right. I think it's a thirty-year time frame, thirty-year like war, that. or something like that. And it was make nice. But uh, yeah, I like I like the steps. Yeah, it's very well, nice. That's kind of interesting that that was the the foundation of the steps, um, because I was there with our daughter. She was a junior and going to be a senior in high school, and we went with another mother daughter. Jack wasn't there. He sent us, and we were sitting on those Spanish steps, and there were lots of local people there. It wasn't just all tourists. Oh, yeah. And everyone started singing on the steps. Ah. And it okay. was yeah. very cool. I, I don't know how long ago, but you know, back in the early 70s, that was like all the place the kids hung out who were backpacking through Europe. But now you're not allowed to sit on the steps anymore. You can barely just sit down to take a picture and they chase the, oh, yeah, the they police chase, you chase right away. away. No one can sit on allowed to eat. Oh, when, when... You notice yeah, that the, the picture Billy took, there was not a single person on the step. That's true. I have that same picture about 10 years ago, and there's crowds all <laughs> sitting on the step. <laughs> well, my, niece, my, niece, yeah. Yeah, my niece was there about two weeks 
or well, less she, than we she, when we were there. And, she and she has nothing but people in the background of her Spanish Steps picture, but it's still a great picture. <laughs> yeah. Billy, Billy, could I ask, tell me about the food that you ate there and what, what did you like? What was your favorite sort of meal to have there in Italy? Well, I tell you what, I'm not adventurous at all, as you you probably know. And so, I, mine was a lot of pasta and a lot of fish and a lot of lasagna. Lot, yeah, a lot of lasagna. And, and Lanny was eating a lot of stuff I would not put in my mouth, but <laughs> she, she was she was enjoying that. Uh, and uh, we have Jack? a question. We're uh, we're going to be visiting Rome in the late part of January. Has anyone been there in the winter time? It's cold, but not as cold as Canada. <laughs> That's not saying too much. <laughs> it's, I don't know what part of the uh, Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. So you're in Wisconsin, so you know cold. It's not yeah. that cold. You know, no. a little further south than you, but you know, like 42s, 52s, you know, you might get a day or two in 20, but you could. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm guessing it'll be, like you said, 35 as max minimum low yeah, and up to um, 45, 55 in the day. It, 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 for the kind of coach you got, you'll probably have to take them off. You'll get too hot. <laughs> right. Right. I wanted to answer Jack about the food. Um, we're foodie, so we eat all kinds of the local foods we look up when we go places. And one trip we took our grandson when we were in Italy, he said to me he wasn't going to eat Italian food at home for a month because he wanted to remember what it was supposed to taste like. <laughs> very, very interesting. And the next day he said to me, how hard is it to make lasagna? So he'd only ever had, you know, Costco lasagna from, you know, somebody who brought it in from the supermarket. And he never had, when you bite into a lasagna in Italy, it's soft. I'm going to say like mashed potatoes. It's just a very soft, 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 soft taste. You don't get that hard, chewy pasta that you would get here. So it's a, a totally different animal. So our tradition now in his birthday, and we're just coming up to it next week, is we make lasagna together. So I go to Little Italy, I get the real pasta and the regatta and the and uh, make a bolognese sauce, and we make the lasagna together. <laughs> oh, what fun! It's a great, great tradition. tradition. Yeah. yeah. But I have to say, the, we had lasagna, uh, and both both of these last two trips to Italy, we had a lot of lasagna, and it was the best we've ever tasted. In Florence, uh, in that plaza, if you're in that plaza, and something you shouldn't miss in Florence is called Florentine steak, and it's a little overwhelming when you see it because it, you can only buy a kilo. What's a kilo, a kilo. It's a two, pound, a two pound two steak. Two point two pound steak. So you share it. So, <laughs> you know, we had a salad and a steak and we actually had a lasagna for an appetizer. We shared between well, three, three people. And it's a thick, a giant thick rib steak, I would say, a really thick, tender, tender one. And um, it, was, it's, it was phenomenally delicious. So Florence, you have to remember- You can almost cut steak. it with a fork. Yeah. I think I've seen that on an episode of Rick Steves and when he's in Florence, and that is one big steak. And, <laughs> and gelati has changed over the years where originally it was mostly fruit or sort of the ice cream flavors you would know. But this time we would come across like Parmesan gelati and they, they've really gone off into artichoke gelati of every single yeah. flavor you could ever imagine. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Well, I had, I think we have time for one more question. Um, in the Coliseum, it, when they, I mean, when you see it in movies and things, um, the whole, so, so the whole thing was, was, had the, not a roof on it, but the arena floor yeah, yeah it was covered up it was all, all those tunnels and things were covered so yes. when they put water in it to have boats then that covered some of the seats or what you said they had 
Uh, I do not know the depth of it. You wouldn't have to have a whole lot of depth to enact a C, C bill, but the, the thought to me was the ability to make it waterproof when you have all those tunnels underneath it. Yeah. That's really well constructed. Yeah. We actually saw a picture. When we were there, we saw a picture of the boats in the water, but I we don't, remember, I, I don't remember the details. Okay. Something new with the Coliseum. Would yeah, okay, go ahead. Hold on, let my husband mute his computer. Um, you Just turn the down. down. How do you do that? <laughs> How do I get a copy of this recording or get to see it again? Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, is, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Vicki, could um, you hold for just a second while okay. Kathleen answers Dennis's question about how do, you, how do you see the video? Hey. Kathleen, why don't you tell Here us? Here I am. I didn't turn my volume on. <laughs> when you're traveling and using your Evergreen, anybody had any issues with that as far as communication with your host? Are they typically... Um, do they speak English? Well, we, Lanny and I has only stayed with two overseas, one in Copenhagen. Her partner spoke English very well. She didn't speak uh, English at all. And the one we stayed with in Paris, France, oh man, she is perfect on her English and so was the roommate. All right, not all right. So. We, we uh, enjoyed we enjoyed four days, three or four days with them. Did you you stayed with Pascal, right? In France, I think we. Uh, she is an older woman. She's yeah. about she is she is eighty two and in and, and very friendly lady. Yeah, very friendly. I think we discussed this before. We stayed at the same. Okay, place. so the answer for her is um, if they're having people, they know they're coming from the U.S. Someone is going to speak English in the house, right? So we've done it in different countries. Well, and Vicki, the application is in English. So they have to fill out the application. It's not offered in other languages. So, you know, someone they know or closely or, or they are able to communicate in English. That's a good question. Um, and let's see, Dennis, you had... Whereas Dennis had a question. Uh, oh, there you are. I'm sorry, what was it? We'd like to see this and take notes about this. Uh, how do we do it? Thank you. So um, we do, um, we've made a recording of it and it will be posted on our YouTube channel, which is, it actually has its own URL now. It's Evergreen Club Homestays. And you can also access, so it takes us about um, a week to 10 days, it sort of depends, to edit it. This one hasn't, didn't have technical problems or anything to be edited out, but so that makes it a little faster to happen. But then um, you can also access it from our blog. And the blog is, you don't even have to log in, it's in the navigation bar, and it has all of the programs we've done for the, since um, March of 2020. Oh. So, um, uh, the other thing is if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will be notified when a new um, video is posted. So that's that's a helpful thing. And it helps us if you subscribe to it. I'm not sure exactly how, but it does. It helps. What so, is the address of the blog? Um, we'll just go on our homepage. So evergreenclub.com. Mm -hmm. And it's in the navigation bar in the upper right. And okay. it says blog. And just click on it. And it has a little synopsis sort of, or a little summary of the program and probably four or five pictures. And then there's a link and you click the link and it shows you the video. 
Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Oh, we'll you'll have it. to. I mean, really, we have over a hundred yeah. um, of these programs, and mm -hmm. they're interesting and fascinating and helpful if you're planning the trip, because the members have really they do a great job with the maps and and giving tips on, you know, the best way to see things or. Um, sometimes tips on the most affordable way to, to get the same thing. Other people might go pay a lot of money for there's an, you know, there are other ways to do it. So, um, they're all really worthwhile to watch and just beautifully done, beautiful pictures. So thank well, you for asking. Thank you. Sure. I have, a, I have a comment. Yes. Um, on that, the Vatican tour, our tour guide did had a wonderful way of, of approaching it. Um, we went to the Vatican Museum first. And when you exit the Vatican Museum Oops. through the back way, mm -hmm. there's a little secret way to get right into St. Peter's Basilica directly without waiting for 2,000 people ahead of you. We just walked right in. There was no security. And it was amazing. Was that recently? Yes, it was. That yeah, was, it was in August. Yeah. Oh, no. this year. Yeah. yeah, we did it. We did it early in the morning. She made sure, like you said, you got up early. We were the first or second group in to the Sistine in, in, Chapel. Yeah, we were first. Yeah, the second, first or second group into to the, the Sistine to the Chapel Vatican door. Museum and then the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. And so there's very little less security there because you only have. I'm going to people who have already paid to go where if you go into the Vatican, it's free. Um, so so you have much less people and, and the security was minimal going in that way. Sistine Chapel first. But, but like I said, she knew this she knew the secret, secret back way because these tour guides know what they're doing. Yeah, <laughs> it was absolutely unbelievable. Huh? That was Heidi. Yeah, that was Heidi. <laughs> I also want to say the Coliseum has a new tour that started this year. And it's a night tour. They only allow 20 or 25 people. And you do, you go through the underground tunnel area. So it's a whole new thing. It's in the dark with things lit up and it's Ooh. a different way to do it. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Well, and something just to be aware of when we went to go into the Coliseum, I had arranged a tour before we went and it said the tour was to the Coliseum. It was not in, in the, the Coliseum. <laughs> and the whole bus was of, of um, visitors was very upset because we all thought we were going in to the Coliseum. And we went right by the arch, Billy showed, and that's where he let us out and we could get out and have our picture taken. And that was it. And that was our last day in Rome. So we didn't get to go in. So, so you, that was a very good point. You have to read the blurbs carefully and say, it, it, it'll say whether you're driving past it. The word to obviously doesn't mean in. And <laughs> it will, it'll say you know, your tour guide will take you through the call scene. It has to have words in there saying those things. Yes. We've we've been to Europe many times and just came back from a month in Paris. We've always freelance. We're not experienced with guides and and uh, buses and stuff. Um, on the other hand, we're older than we used to be, so perhaps we should try that. Yeah, yeah I don't we, know where to start. Yeah, we used to freelance all the time. We drove. You use what freelance? No, we used to. We used, we to, used do that to do all that time. that way, and we drove. We had a car. We drove all through France and whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's gotten very much more complicated because of the security involved. We you oh. really have to know in each place. You have to buy your thing online for a specific day for a specific time, and you have to know. Does that is that one going to have security to get in? Do I have to allow another half an hour? There's so many things you have to know now that we have decided to do more of these tours and do ones that have, how would you say, a structure, but leave us free time in that city so we can go and do the things we want to do. So like 
Hilly said, we didn't take the optional tours that they would give, and we would take that free time and do what we wanted. So if you want to give us a call, look us up and, and we could talk to you about it because we have slowly changed um, our touring as well. So half on our own and half with them. So we use them to get us places, to get us into a decent hotel, to give us an overview of the city, and then kind of we'll do our own thing. Got it. Thank you. Well, oh, that's really helpful. Well, all right. Um, it's 10 after seven or eight now, so um, we should wrap up, but we will leave the Zoom line open um, if anybody wants to stay in chat for a little bit longer. Uh, do remember that um, um, Billy is going to be doing part two um, on uh, the first Sunday in December. And so we're really looking forward to that. And we have a good program lined up for February. That's on the, um, Mary Williams is going to give that on the ancestral Puebloans in New Mexico. And I figured February, cold, be in the South, do something where it'd be warmer. So um, anyway, so those should be great programs. And everyone have a very um, wonderful Thanksgiving. And uh, we will see you early in December. Sounds great. Good Thanks, good. everyone. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Nice. Stop the recording.